Welcome back to Her Rules Radio. This is Alex Jameson. If this is your first time listening, welcome to the show. This is the place to be for women who are ready to live life by their own rules. And sometimes that requires looking at your entire life and figuring out how we're going to start making small changes, reclaiming our energy, our power, our voice. And today's show has a lot of inspiration and education for you on that front. Now, before we dive in with our amazing guest, I have to admit, I had a horrible flu all week last week. It took me out. I haven't had the flu in years. And it's funny, my younger sister works in a hospital. She gets the flu shot every year. I don't remember the last time I got a flu shot, but we both got the flu at the same time. We were both out for several days. and. We were just texting each other back and forth about what TV shows we were watching. It was kind of fun. It was one of the few bright spots in a week of a lot of coughing and a lot of laying down in bed and going, ugh. So anyway, back on track. I hope you're feeling good today. I hope the flu has skipped over your house this year. But today we've got a deep dive with an incredible coach, an incredible educator, Lisa Hendrickson Jack. Lisa is a certified fertility awareness educator holistic reproductive health practitioner and author of The Fifth Vital Sign, Master Your Cycles and Optimize Your Fertility. Now we're going to go into a lot of really important topics to help empower you to take control of your health, your moods, your energy, your life, and your fertility. Now we're going to be talking about how the education systems around the world have really failed to teach us about our fertility, our hormones, and the the intricate symphony that is our female health. Lisa helps health-conscious women, just like you, discover the connection between our menstrual cycles and our overall health so that we can do so much, including ditch our hormonal birth control forever. She is a true genius at this work. Now, before I introduce you to Lisa, I want to share a bit about another book by racial justice educator Catrice M. Jackson. Her new book called Unfuckable With, I love the title, subtitle, Rising from the Ashes into Your Black Woman Badassery. And this is a book for black women. Catrice wrote this as a love note, a guide of support and wisdom. And following Catrice's lead, I bought a few copies and sent them as gifts to the black women that I love in my life. And I recommend doing this to all of you. If you have black women in your life who you love and care about, just get your friend's address, go to Amazon, and order Unfuckable With by Catrice Jackson. Now, I also highly recommend Catrice's in-person workshops for white women who are ready to step up or endeavor to be allies, to be real allies in social justice work and racial justice work. These workshops are called She Talks, We Talk. Catrice was just in San Francisco. She'll be in New York City twice this year, and she's holding workshops all around the U.S. in 2019. I went to a workshop last year. It was one of the most powerful workshops I've ever done. I'm going again this year in New York City. It's not that I didn't get enough from the first one. The first one was absolutely incredible, one of the most powerful workshops I've ever been to. But there's more. There's always going to be more to do for us white women. We have a lot of work to do. These workshops are, I think, the fastest, most effective, powerful way to step into this work or deepen your work. So here's what I want you to do. Go to Catriceology, C-A-T-R-I-C-E, O-L-O-G-Y dot com, Catriceology, and find a workshop near you. Sign up, go, and get her book, Unfuckable With. Send it to a black woman that you love. Now, here's Lisa and her work helping women with her new book, The Fifth Vital Sign. Okay, welcome back to the show, everyone. I have the amazing Lisa Hendrickson Jack here, direct from her podcast, Fertility Friday, onto her rules radio. Hi, Lisa. Hi, thanks so much for having me. 
Great to have you. So excited to talk about your brand new book, baby, The Fifth Vital Sign. Yes, it was. Well, you know, because you are also an author. It was quite the journey to get the book into an actual thing that's in the world. Yeah. And it's beautiful. The cover is incredible. If you're listening to this and you can't see it, please go look up the cover because you're going to want to buy it immediately. (laughs) I'll tell the audience. I asked my designer to make it look like a vulva, but not like literally like a vulva. Reminiscent. Evocative of. (laughs) And my clients have told me that like their partners, like if they're partnered to a male, as soon as they look at it, they're like, oh yeah. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. Got it. Okay. Well, we have a lot to cover because your book really, like this is I think one of the new textbooks for women who want to get to know their body, who want to take control of what you're calling the fifth vital sign. And and so tell us a little bit about that. What is like, why did you call it the fifth vital sign? What is a vital sign? Well, thank you for that compliment. That's a huge compliment to kind of equate it to like a textbook because it's insane in terms of the like citations and all of the detail and everything. So thank you for that. The reason that I called it the fifth vital sign, so that was an idea that was introduced to me at quite a young age. And so I started charting my cycles when I was about 18-ish. And at first, I mean, it was like a, just a really serendipitous, like looking back, it just looks like it was meant to be. So back then it was like the year 2000, I was just first year university and I went to this talk on my campus, you know, I was into all the feministy things. And this woman, Inga Misio, wrote the book Cunt, A Declaration of Independence. And she came to our school and she did a, you know, she read from her book. And that was the first time I'd ever heard that the menstrual cycle, there was only a short window of time that you could get pregnant. And so I jumped on that and bought Taking Charge of Your Fertility, started charting. And there was a group of women on my campus, some of whom were trained teachers, some of whom were training. And so I started attending their monthly meetings. And eventually, of course, I started teaching and I took a training class through Justice HealthWorks because they were located in the city that I went to university with, one of the few organizations that teach fertility awareness. So so what happened in my case was that I was charting and I was super excited about it. And I thought that my long, you know, 45 on average day cycles were just a unique expression of myself (laughs) because I was 18 or 19, like I had no idea. And my charting instructor was like, yeah, no, your temperatures are too low. Your cycles are too long. You need to get your thyroid checked. And so it was really early on that that idea that the menstrual cycle is a vital sign, that's something that I was taught, you know, back then when I was training to teach women. And so Fast forward to now, I mean, we've made a lot of ground. Periods are like in the media all the time. (laughs) I'm surprised that we haven't started like live menstruating on Instagram. Oops, I said it out loud. That's probably going to be a thing (gasps) next week. But they're going to take your picture down off of Instagram. Oh, no. But even though there's this global conversation, there's still your average woman still doesn't really understand how her cycle works. And your average doctor doesn't really think that the menstrual cycle is important unless you're actively trying to get pregnant, which is so ironic. So when we think of vital signs, like the most common vital signs would be that we're familiar with would be like our temperature and our heart rate and our respiratory rate. And that makes sense. We go to the doctor, they're going to test those things and they, the doctor has a standard range of what's normal. So if your temperature is way too high, that's an indication that you could have a fever or an infection. So not only does the vital sign give you information just about your health, it also gives the doctor a specific roadmap of where to look if it's off. So, you know, your blood pressure is too high or low, the doctor would have very specific things to look at in either case. And the menstrual cycle is like that. So with the menstrual cycle, there's also a normal established set of parameters where, and it's not just length. So we're all taught, you know, only 28 days and, but, you know, the menstrual cycle can vary from 24 to 35 days in a healthy woman. Ovulation can vary as well. But there's all these other factors that we can look at. We can look at her period. You know, how long is it? How heavy is it? How long into her cycle? How long does it take her to ovulate? How many days does she have cervical mucus as she approaches ovulation? How long is her luteal phase? And when you kind of understand that your cycle is quite complex and there's all these different factors, then you can appreciate how if certain aspects of that are off, And if it falls outside of the normal range, not only is it giving us information about our health, but it also gives us a specific roadmap of where to look. So the argument that the menstrual cycle is a vital sign is getting a lot, like a lot more people are saying it now. And there's a lot of health professionals that are specifically saying, like, we need to look at this as a vital sign, you know, in young girls and things like that. But 
it is what it is. Like it's a real thing. And we have to talk about it because the medical professionals aren't. So if we just have to start talking about it, maybe they'll start talking about it later on. And I think they are. I think they're starting to clue in. Like you said, it really is becoming a more mainstream topic. And the menstrual cycle and learning about it as a vital sign is not just about having babies. And that's the big message really in the book. That's why I put a vulva on the cover. Because, you know, even if a woman doesn't want to have children ever, it doesn't mean that she shouldn't have a healthy endocrine system. And so part of the problem is that medicine, the study of science and medicine, was really heavily based on the male body. From that perspective then, like women are just men with menstrual cycles. And so it's kind of like, like the analogy I like to use is like, if, if I were to go and buy a car, I can choose whether or not to get AC. And if I get AC or don't get AC, the car function doesn't change. <laughs> We are not like that. <laughs> right. So you can't just like add an accoutrement or add a, a something and it's basically the same. Yeah. So with us as women, there's this weird idea in medicine that our menstrual cycle is kind of like the AC and we can take hormones to shut it off turn it on, whatever, and it's not going to affect us. But when you look at the laundry list of side effects associated with birth control, it's quite clear that, you know, messing with a woman's menstrual cycle has significant effects on her health beyond whether or not she wants to have kids. I think one of the really clear and obvious examples outside of the birth control pill is hypothalamic amenorrhea. So for the audience members, that's like a big mouthful, but basically it's when you stop menstruating as a woman. A lot of us are more familiar with that concept in athletes where we almost think it's normal for a woman to lose her period when she's like heavily into sports. But what happens, so first of all, HA, hypothalamic amenorrhea, is associated with very specific situations, over-exercise, under-nutrition, and stress. And most women who lose their periods have a combination of those three going. And so what is happening in that situation is that your body is starving, basically, and or totally stressed out. Connection, the conversation between your hypothalamus, your pituitary, and your ovaries is shut down. Because your body is highly intelligent and is protecting you from the disastrous effects that a pregnancy would cause in that type of state. And so by desperately trying to conserve your energy, it is halting the menstruation and the ovulation. What happens for women in that state, one of the side effects is that they start to rapidly lose bone mass. So women who have HA and the longer that it extends are at an increased risk for osteoporosis. Well, geez. That doesn't sound like it's related to pregnancy, but it certainly is important for our health. So how could our periods not be an important sign of health? And, and this really speaks to one of the ongoing themes throughout your book, which is what does a normal cycle look like? And just a personal story for me, I was thinking back in my own experience how my menstrual cycle was absolutely a fifth vital sign. You know, I was vegan for over a decade and towards the end of it, things really started to go badly, badly, badly. And one of the vital signs was my hormones were a disaster. I had really had very few period problems in my life, very minimal PMS. I was on the pill for a little tiny bit, but I'll, I might talk about that later because it was terrifying what happened. But when I started having exhaustion, insomnia, and my cycle started coming every 14 to 16 days. It was like, oh my gosh, this is horrible. It was so debilitatingly exhausting. So let's talk about this idea of a normal cycle. Is normal in quotes, is there such a thing as normal? There is. I mean, I would say that we could, we could use the word normal, we could use the word healthy, but ultimately I think what's important when we're having a conversation of what, what a normal cycle looks like is to recognize that there is a range of what is normal. And really it involves like de deprogramming from all the information that we're taught growing up. So as women, it's almost like, like when I'm working with women and teaching them to chart their cycles, it's like we have to deprogram. Like half of the battle is like unlearning all the, the myths and all the stuff. You're like the period Yoda. You have to unlearn <laughs> yes. what you have learned. Unlearn, yes. I'm like, I like that. The differentiation between what a healthy cycle is and what a normal cycle. I like that so much. Yeah. And understanding that. So as women, we're taught really that the cycle is 28 days and that's the only way that a normal cycle presents and that ovulation happens on day 14. 
So, you know, I've worked with a number of women who have cycles that are like 32 days long and they actually actively think it's a problem because it's not 28. (laughs) So in terms of a normal cycle, I alluded to the parts, but we can go through it in a bit more detail. So a healthy cycle can range between about 24 to 35 days. And it's really important to note that a woman can have a cycle that is 28 days and not healthy. Let's just put that out there. So the length itself is one of the factors, but it's not the only factor. So with that idea in mind, then ovulation, if a woman's having a cycle that's either, you know, from 24 to 35 days, ovulation does not happen on day 14 all the time. We are not robots. Women, even women who have and identify with like having really regular quote unquote cycles, a lot of women will say like, it's like clockwork comes at the same day every, you know, but when you actually chart like your actual cycle, you'll notice that it does fluctuate. So even if it's quite regular... It might be 27 days one cycle, 29 days another, and that's perfectly normal. And that's because we're not robots. I'll keep saying that if I need to, (laughs) but I think we get it. So then in a healthy cycle, ovulation can take place anywhere from, say, day 10 to day 23 which is really helpful. So, you know, the fertility awareness method is very practical for women. The fertility essentially means that you're identifying when in your cycle you're fertile, and then you can decide what you're going to do with that information. So some women are actively trying to get pregnant, and so they're going to try to have sex, obviously, during that time. And other women are actively avoiding it, and so they're going to manage their fertile window and avoid unprotected sex. So if you're trying to get pregnant and you believe that ovulation always happens on day 14, but you ovulate on like day 10, or you ovulate on day 23, there is a percentage of women for whom like literally they just need to switch the timing and then they'll get pregnant. It's not that simple. Fertility challenges are really complex as you and I both know, but it's important to put that out there, right? Because it's a thing. Yeah. So in addition to those aspects of it, we would look at the, the period. So a healthy period lasts anywhere from three to seven days. So if it's like really short, so there's an interesting movement where women are engaging in certain types of diets and, and losing either losing their period or bleeding way less because we live in a very period negative environment where, you know, if periods are gross and dirty and all the, the stereotypes and whatever, a lot of women feel like it's a good thing, right? Like my periods are so light now that we don't even realize that there's actually normal. So a normal period in terms of the length, you know, three to seven days, but in terms of the volume, anywhere from 25 to 80 milliliters. So if for women who use like menstrual cups throughout the entire time that you have your period, like all three to seven days, you would expect to fill it once (laughs) in total if you added it all up. So if you're not even filling a cup once, you know, throughout the whole time, that's a sign of, because your period is a printout of your hormones the previous month. Mm. In order for you to have a period, what happens is as you approach ovulation, your your ovaries are producing estrogen and estrogen is what proliferates and builds up the uterine lining after it's shed. And then after ovulation, I mean, you're only producing progesterone after ovulation. If you don't ovulate, you're not producing significant progesterone. And progesterone causes the lining to mature, thicken, and really become robust and receptive to a fertilized egg. So both of these events have to occur (laughs) in order for your uterine lining to develop. And ovulation has to occur in order for you to have an actual real period. Just put that out there as well. We can talk about that a bit more. But Mm -hmm. when you think of it that way, then if you have a period that's like a day long or two days and it's like so scant that you're barely filling a pad or a tampon or a cup, that's an indication of a hormonal issue. And I think that's, again, we often hear, like we kind of get more readily that a heavy, like a period that's really, really heavy. So if you're filling like six pads a day for five days, like we kind of, or like, you know what I mean? Like if it's just like so, so heavy, we kind of have a sense that like that's a problem, but we don't necessarily have a sense that like there's a such thing as too light. Yeah. And and you're right. It really does speak to the negative period culture that we grow up in, that we're all brainwashed with. (laughs) Yeah. That it's such an interesting dichotomy because for, you know, I'll paint a pretty wide brush with this, but it's like, you know, women are kind of elevated, like, oh, they're mothers and they, they're they nurturers, yet the way that we get there is considered disgusting and <laughs> abhorrent. So it's just another way that women can't win. Like, we just can't win. There's always something wrong with us <laughs> or our bodies. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I have this like really strong opinion. Maybe someday I'll, maybe, you know, we'll figure out how to get this. But I believe that, you know, when I have to go to the bathroom, like when I have to, you know, urinate or take a poo or something, and I go to a public bathroom, there's toilet paper there for me because our society acknowledges that that's like a normal thing that we all do. For some reason, there's no, you know, pads or tampons or anything like that. It's mm-hmm. as if 
so, and that in of itself speaks volumes. I've actually had women kind of criticize me for saying that. Oh. Thing too. But how? It's a normal and bodily, it's a normal bodily yeah. function. That I feel like that's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of how ridiculous our society is with menstruation. Well, a hopeful note, little personal story here. My son's middle school has little baskets of free pads and tampons out in every single stall. Like that's so the boys so the boys see it. It's in all the all like all the bathrooms are like whatever gender can use this bathroom, you know, it's pretty awesome. So let's get back to like the nuts and bolts stuff that women are listening for today. Okay. Did you want me to to talk about like the rest of the menstrual cycle things? Oh yeah. Sorry. We weren't done yet. Keep going. There's a lot. I mean, there is. We talked about length. (laughs) Yes. And much more than just the length. We talked about length. We talked about ovulation. We talked about periods. So I'll talk about cervical mucus. So as you approach ovulation, you would expect to have anywhere from about two to seven days of mucus. So a lot of women have observed it, but didn't know what it is because we're not really taught about mucus. And for what it looks like, it can look like clear, stretchy, raw egg white type fluid. It can also look like creamy white hand lotion. And both are an indication that you're approaching ovulation and both are an indication of fertility in your pre-ovulatory phase. And the reason why is because when you have mucus, you can your mucus keeps sperm alive for up to five days. Like we often hear that, like your body keeps sperm alive for up to five days, but it's not just like all the time. (laughs) There's only a small window where, and it's when we're making this mucus. And it's interesting, you know, our mucus is, it's like the mirror parallel to seminal fluid, a man's seminal fluid. They're the same pH. And it actually changes the pH of our vagina, making our vagina like super hospitable to all this great sperm. But it's only during that specific period of time. So in a healthy cycle, we would expect to have mucus, not forever, not never. So we would expect to have about two to seven days, at least one day where we see clear, stretchy or wipe and feel like like it's really slippery. Some women don't have lots of clear, stretchy, but they'll, they'll notice like it's slippery when they're wiping lubricative. Leading to ovulation. So in order to have a healthy cycle, you got to ovulate. And then in the second half of the cycle, we would expect that to be at least about two weeks long. So the period of time between ovulation and your period is typically about 12 to 14 days. And although we can't predict when ovulation is going to happen because it varies. So if there's for us as, you know, when, when women start charting their cycles, I think one of the things that is most interesting and surprising is how responsive our cycles are to stress in our daily lives and things like that. So for instance, a lot of women will find that if they have a, a stressful experience or something going on before they ovulate, that their ovulation might be delayed. But the period, the period of time, period of time between your period and ovulation is about the same. So we, can, we can't predict exactly when our ovulation is going to happen, but we can predict our period, which is very, very helpful. <laughs> so if you're like, if any of those signs are off, if the length is way off, what a regular cycle really means, because I think every woman thinks that if it's not 28 days, it's irregular, but irregular cycle, what that really means is that there's a wide variation, about eight days or more from cycle to cycle. If you have less than nine or eight periods a year. So that there's a more specific definition of irregular. If the period is way off, if the mucus is way off, if the luteal phase is way off, then those are the very specific things we're looking at. So your cycle is normal if it falls within those parameters. I know this reminds me of a conversation I had with one of the other moms at school. And we were, she was pregnant with her next kid. And she's like, I learn so much stuff about my body when I get pregnant that my mind says, I should have known this all along. And as you're talking, like, why don't we know this stuff? Like, I didn't know until probably the last three years, because I hang out with you and Nicole Jardim online, which (laughs) is that the, the thing you said about the mucus keeping the sperm viable for seven, for five days. Like, why did I not know that? How is that not widely known? Well, and there's implications of not knowing. So the few that come to mind, I mean, a lot of women end up in their doctor's office because they think they have an infection because they have, they keep getting this discharge, right? My all-time favorite word. And so a lot of women have experienced mucus. And so some women experience it like they they feel wetness, like they have, like they think they have their period and they run to the bathroom, but there's no period. Some women experience it like they're wiping and they're seeing it, but they actually think it's an infection. And then they go and get tested. The test comes back negative. Some unfortunate women still get a prescription for antibiotics. Mm, (laughs) Right? Even though they're not, there's nothing there except mucus. So it's really, 
it's, it's a whole, like that was, so, you know, in the book, there's like, I have a whole chapter. It's like, who would think that there's so much to say about mucus, but it's really fascinating. We, we spend a lot of time Mm -hmm. learning about our ears and our eyes, which is important, but so a couple of really interesting qualities of cervical mucus, it does keep sperm alive. It is the right pH. It rapidly transports sperm into our cervical crypts. There's this myth about like, I think there was an article that came out recently, but there's this myth about like how sperm are these champions. Like we watch, you know, American hero movies and it's yeah, like- Yeah, they all have little capes. Yeah, so <laughs> the sperm, they're like champions swimming really hard. No, no, no. <laughs> what actually happens is when we're in our fertile window, if a man ejaculates, you know, and, and the, the, like the, the mucus and the ejaculatory fluid touch, our mucus actually actively draws the sperm and rapidly transports them into our cervix. Mm, like the and sirens our, singing yes. to the sailors. <laughs> and then our uterus has muscle contractions that then propel the sperm up. So the sperm are not swimming. They're literally like twitching and our bodies are actively pulling them into where they need to go. And that rapid transport has been shown, like sperm have been found in the fallopian tubes within minutes after ejaculation. Our bodies are amazing. Can you just say, okay, so let's go to the next logical question, which a lot of women are probably thinking, which is, okay, so this is the range of healthy. And these are some things to start looking at for myself to know myself better, which by the way, I really see all of this education that you're offering us is, this is such a deep incredibly beautiful way to know ourselves better and to understand and become our own best experts. So so the next logical space is, all right, a lot of us have period pain and PMS and mood disturbances, et cetera. Are those all symptoms of unhealthy periods or are these kind of par for the course or how can we manage them better? I think that a big part of myth busting is, again, to answer the question, your original question, which is what is normal? And so, I mean, there's differences of opinions there. So I, as in my personal experience, I had painful periods for years, like so painful that when I went into labor with my first son, I was like, this can't be labor. <laughs> my period pain hurts more than this. You, literally. No way. <laughs> Yeah. It wasn't until I was closer to active labor that I was like, oh, I think this is actually labor because they keep coming every 10 minutes, right? And in my work, as you can imagine, I've spoken to hundreds of women who have period pain. And yeah, so what would be, there's a difference between normal and common. I think that's really helpful to point out. It's really common for women to have period pain, but it's not normal. I mean, having pain that requires you to take pain medication in order to, women are, the other thing I've come to know, a few things I've discovered over the last couple of years, So in order to get like an actual description of what type of pain my client is experiencing, I have to directly ask and I have to specifically ask her to put herself on a pain scale. Because as women, the culture tells us that pain is normal. When I was growing up with the Midol commercials, right? But like, we're just told that this is normal there. And even if you go to your practitioner, there was a time when they didn't even believe that it was real, right? Like we had to fight to be believed that we were actually in pain. (laughs) kind of foolishness. Well, let's be honest, (laughs) that still happens across the medical (laughs) spectrum with women, especially to women of color. We've had several experts on the show talking about how they are not believed, how we are not believed. You're not crazy. Yeah. Okay. Keep going, Lisa. Yeah. So there's all of that. So, you know, first of all, you know, it's common, but pain necessitating the use of medication is an indication of a problem. That's the whole point. It's the fifth vital sign. So I think for me, the way the approach that I take in terms of period pain or anything really is education, obviously. So the first thing is to understand what happens in in a period. And that occurred to me as I was writing the period pain chapter. Because I was like, well, you know, like what is a period and why, like, you know what I mean? Like if we understand what's actually happening in a healthy period, then maybe we can understand why sometimes women experience pain. Because if, if pain was normal, every woman would experience pain across the board. But we know that that's not true. We know that every woman doesn't experience pain painful periods. So therefore there has to be a difference, right? That makes sense. So what's actually happening when we have our period is a natural inflammatory process. So there's a number of reproductive processes specifically that as women we experience ovulation and periods are two examples of that. There, it's a natural inflammatory process. So in order for us to have menstruation, 
what has to happen is our body does naturally produce some prostaglandins. So those are proteins that are associated with inflammation. And they basically, one of the roles is to contract and help our bodies empty, like help our help the blood to flow, help our bodies to kind of get rid of that dead tissue that needs to be shed. And so period involves the shedding of this tissue that has disintegrated, the prostaglandins helping to kind of make that happen. So this is a natural process, but it, the pain part happens when we have too much inflammation. What the research shows is that women who experience painful periods have prostaglandin levels anywhere up to four times uh, the levels that women who do not have pain experience. And so it's basically like an inflammatory process gone overboard. So the first step to understanding that is to recognize pain is an actual issue. How is it that we can even be having this conversation, Alex? Like, how can we even be thinking that pain is normal, right? Like any other circumstance, we can recognize that pain is a problem. But for somehow when women are experiencing pain with menstruation, we're going to tell them that that's normal. That doesn't even make sense. But this is where we're at. Well, I do, you know, I do think it, <laughs> it goes back to the, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to blame the Bible. I'm going to blame the Bible. <laughs> I am not calling out Christianity here. I'm just talking about the, you know, the the myth that we all grow up with, the story. You know, we, we're paying for our sins because we're, we're paying weird. for our sins, and that birth is painful. So of course, menstruation. It's a, you know, you're paying for your sins, and of course, it's associated with childbirth. So it's going to be painful. Like check, that's it. That's as far as the conversation goes in most people's minds. Well, and, but if you can understand what, because that's another thing. Are we ever, t- we, t- we are taught that we bleed, but that's only, I feel like they teach us in school that we bleed because they don't want us to make a mess. I don't feel like they do it out of our, like for our own good, but that's just me. That's just my opinion. But when it comes to periods, like we, I, similar to everything else we've talked about, we're not provided with an actual detailed explanation of how any of it works and what a normal process would look like to even give us the frame of reference to be able to detect what's normal versus abnormal. So step one, we need to learn what a period is and how it's a natural inflammatory process and how we do need to have these inflammatory markers in order for it to happen properly. But when it when there's pain, they have done science experiments where they can tell the difference in many ways between women who experience pain and women who don't. So that gives us more information. So step one is to acknowledge, you know, first of all, all, all women are different. We're not all going to respond to the same thing. Some of us are allergic to dairy. Some of us are allergic to hay, like, you know, so the first step is to recognize that we're not all the same. But we can look at a long list of inflammatory issues that could contribute to pain. So whether that is the hormones that they put in meat, dairy products, the pesticides that they put on, the disruptor endocrine function, you know, there's a lot of different things we can look to. The inflammatory oils a lot of us use to cook with, vegetable oils and things like that. So the very basic foundation is to start understanding that our bodies are responding to our environments and trying to figure out what in our environments are contributing to this inflammation. And then the second part is to actually like address some of the things. So, I mean, we could go into this, the period pain conversation is quite big. I know you asked me about period pain and you had asked me about something, PMS symptoms as well. And I know that diet has been such a traditional part of my show here and it takes up a good portion of your book. And I want to talk about maybe some of the the top ways that women can start examining how their diet is influencing or causing period pain and PMS symptoms. Well, when you think about so period pain is being related to inflammation then so looking at first of all like the food that we're eating the difference between processed foods and real whole foods and then the quality of the foods that we're eating so it's not always in everyone's budget to switch to everything to organic and all of that but i think it's helpful just to start the conversation and to recognize what some of the most common offenders are so like i'm when it comes to meat sourcing meat the you know the meat producers of conventional meat products they put hormones in the meat to make them grow faster and so that disrupts our endocrine system and then can contribute to inflammation the meat in conventional like conventionally raised meat they're eating you know corn and soy which is not what cows are supposed to eat <laughs> But beyond that, the majority of the corn and soy is genetically modified. So we've got like a double whammy. They're eating foods that they're not supposed to eat. And then they, they, you know, this is the great thing about science, right? Because we can look at the research studies when they actually look at the meat that come from these animals, the actual meat has a higher inflammatory profile. Whereas cows that graze on grass, duh, what they're supposed to be eating in the first place, have a much more favorable fatty acid profile. The balance of omega-3 to omega-6 
ratios in terms of what we eat. That's something that's been popularized. Like I feel like Dr. Oz is the first time I first person I heard talk about that like a long, long time ago, but we're all more sensitized to it now, but your typical, you know, North American diet research shows us it's as high as like 20 to one omega six to omega three. And it's supposed to be one to one. So that's way out of whack. (laughs) Right. And that might sound extreme, but where, like, if you think about what we eat, when you're eating processed foods, processed foods are all made with vegetable oils, which I would term industrial seed oils because it's not a vegetable. They're being shoved out of seeds. So even that is an interesting marketing tool to call them vegetable oils. So really it's looking at some of those basic, basic things. Like if you have severe period pain, looking at, even though it might be more expensive, but looking at what your options are, it doesn't necessarily have to be organic meat. I know for me, I can often get meat that is not listed as organic because the farmers didn't get their, you know, organic sticker, but their cows graze on grass and they're local. And therefore, we're getting a a more favorable fatty acid profile. So, you know, start there. Dairy products, I think that's an interesting topic. I think you can tell from my book, Alex, like a lot of practitioners are very much like anti-dairy, like as a concept. Yes, they are. But I mean, for me, when you actually look at it, dairy is complicated. And I don't think it it makes sense to just say like no to dairy because there's complexities. So for example, different cows produce milk with different proteins. And the majority of our milk, conventional conventional milk in the grocery store, comes from Holstein cows. And Holstein cows produce milk that contain an a, a protein called A1 beta casein. There's all these research studies that's really scary, actually, that are linking this particular protein to all, like a whole host of different issues from you know, inflammation, autoimmune issues, it just goes on and on. And there's a lot of people that identify as lactose intolerant because they know that when they drink milk, they have problems, but they can tolerate other types of milk. They can tolerate goat's milk. So what, you know, when you look at the history, for the majority of human history, we were drinking milk that came from cows that produced a different protein, A2 beta casein. And at some point in the evolutionary history, they kind of broke off. So this is like a big, long tangent about milk. But basically, they chose the Holstein cows, from my understanding, because they make more. So they produce more, (laughs) whereas, you know, the other types of animals produce less. So what's happening kind of in the industry, like the milk industry, the dairy industry, similar to what's happening with the movement of organic food, a lot of dairy farmers are now moving to getting their herds, like sourcing instead Jersey cows, Guernsey cows, that don't have that problematic protein. Because a lot of people are finding that, hey, I can't have this type of milk, but I can actually drink milk from these Guernsey and Jersey cows that has this A2 protein instead of the A1 protein. And a lot of women then who have painful periods, it's not necessarily dairy as a concept. It's a combination of this protein, the fact that conventional cows are fed on grains, genetically modified, making the milk itself have a higher inflammatory profile, the homogenization process, which you know shoves the milk through the little tiny holes therefore increasing the surface area, therefore increasing oxidation, therefore making the milk more inflammatory. It's a really interesting conversation. And I take it back to what did our answer, like human beings have been drinking milk for like 10,000 years. So, but there's a huge difference between what people were drinking 300 years ago and what Mm -hmm. we're drinking now, right? Right, right. Yeah, we actually joined a milk club here in New York City. The laws are different by state here in the United States. So getting really high quality milk and dairy products from Guernsey cows and Jersey cows that you're talking about here in New York state is actually very complicated to get that kind of stuff. You have to get it from an, oh my gosh, we buy it from an Amish farmer who comes in from Pennsylvania and you literally go to a corner and buy it from a guy in cash out of a white van. It's like, (laughs) like you're buying drugs. Exactly. So in Canada, it's illegal. (laughs) Drugs are illegal now. Like you can get the marijuana and stuff, but you can't get the milk. Yeah. There's a little bit of a loophole in New York state. It's super easy in other states to get it. But so let's talk about the number one inflammatory food, sugar. Yeah. Sugar. (laughs) Gotta be sugar, right? Well, yeah. I mean, there's so many factors and variables, I feel like. And when you say sugar, I know it, it conjures up an image of like gummy candies and stuff, right? And like actual white sugar. Right. But people don't necessarily think, so when you consume, like, you know, when you consume simple carbohydrates, what goes into your bloodstream, like your body thinks of sugar differently than your brain does. So you think of sugar as like candy, but a lot of people don't think of sugar as like white bread and like all the different, all the ketchup. different. 
<laughs> yeah. So it's an interesting conversation. I think that as women, many of us underestimate the impact that sugar can have on our bodies. We don't necessarily recognize that it's inflammatory. And especially because for the majority of the past you know, 30 years, fat has been really demonized and no attention has been given to sugar. Yeah. So when, when you have like a group of people like North America who are trying to avoid fat, the only way to do that, like there's, there's only three macronutrients, people. There's like protein, fat, and carbohydrates. So if you get rid of fat, then the only thing that you have left are protein and carbs. And you can't eat that much protein because your body will physically object. So it's a really big problem because in order to get, like in order to kind of get that sugar habit under control, and the first thing is to recognize what, uh, like, so sugar is a carbohydrate. Carbohydrates are not bad or good, but in every category, there are more favorable options and less favorable options, right? So when you think of carbohydrates, are you thinking about vegetables and like legumes and like things that don't raise your blood sugar and cause you deep inflammation? Or do you think carbs means cookies? So the first thing is to kind of like get that straight. But the second thing is you can't just like cut carbs and then like not eat. In order to have a balanced diet, it's important to eat until you're full and satisfied and recognize that you can't just get rid of sugar without adjusting the other two. Like you have to start eating fat. <laughs> well, it's, com- or it's else very hard for us. All the time. It's very, very hard for us to make sense of this because most of us grew up, I grew up in the seventies and eighties and nineties and fat was the devil. Yes. And, capital D. Yeah. And it took a long time for the science to catch up with really traditional ways of eating, which really said, no, like fat and organ meats, like that's where it's at. And you go really into organ meats and the value of that, which is so wonderful. I'm a big fan of the desiccated organ meats myself, taking them as supplements for hormonal stuff. But it is challenging and it's tough because I've coached a lot of women through, you know, getting off certain foods to help their energy and their focus. and your brain is the biggest consumer of glucose in the body. So if you just take away sugar, your brain is going to feel it and you're going to feel tired and unfocused for a bit. And that's, you know, that's like the biggest obstacle to making these big dietary changes. Even if we know they're good for us, our brain is like, feed me. Well, and it's interesting that you say that, Alex, because your brain is 60% fat and in your entire body, it contains the most cholesterol. (laughs) <laughs> yes. So we actually need the stuff that we were told to stay away from for yeah. our whole childhoods. Well, because we, I mean, I think one of the arguments around, you know, cholesterol being bad and we don't need to eat it is that our bodies can make cholesterol, which is true. But I mean, it's your liver that has to make cholesterol. And if you're eating all the sugar, your liver is really busy trying to get the sugar out of your bloodstream. And so taxing it with the additional task of having to make all your cholesterol. I think it's it's interesting. So in my book, I talk about <laughs> fat as like a source of nutrition, which I think is yeah. really important. And not all fat, because in every category, we have more favorable options and less mm-hmm. favorable options. Mm-hmm. But when you think about animal fat in particular, animal fat is a source of fat-soluble vitamins, vitamins A, D, E, and K. And so if you, for instance, milk is a good example of that. So if you do have you know, access, which is a huge issue, but access to, I don't think we need to kind of like say there's just one type, but even just understanding the the complexities and looking for better, like maybe you can find organic non-homogenized, right? Maybe you can find grass fed, like what can you find in your community? But even if you think about it, like I grew up in the eighties and nineties. And so it was very much a time when fat was bad. And and I remember my parents started drinking like skim milk. And I remember as a kid, I couldn't, like, I literally couldn't, I couldn't do it. I was like, this tastes like chalk. Like, I don't know what to tell you. But what's interesting is when you drink skim milk, like when you take off the fat, you're literally removing all of the nutrition. You're removing all of the fat soluble vitamins and you're also removing the cholesterol. So and, and cholesterol is a precursor to all of our steroid hormones. So, you know, in my lovely, de- de- you know, description of the menstrual cycle, and I'm talking about estrogen and progesterone, we need cholesterol to make estrogen and progesterone and testosterone and cortisol and vitamin D. <laughs> so, I mean, these, it's pretty significant. And unless we get our heads around that and start to recognize that that is actually a source of nutrition, then, and especially for women who are concerned about their hormonal health, because if you, you need to understand like the building blocks of hormone health are actually like butter. 
and animal fat. Thank goodness. <laughs> um, well, you know, our entire conversation and your book, The Fifth Vital Sign, really, it just reminds me that I work with so many hyper-educated, super intelligent, really accomplished women who have are carrying around the secret shame and confusion. Like, I don't understand. Like, I've been doing everything I was taught to do and I'm still not feeling good or it still doesn't feel right for me. You know, what's wrong with me? When in reality, we haven't been taught the truth. I don't think it was some nefarious plot to educate us, but we are now learning the truth of how our bodies work at a later stage than maybe we should have been about what real nutrition really is. So if it feels confusing and frustrating, there's a reason for that. We've been miseducated for most of our lives around this. And your book goes into so much more that we don't have time to cover, including PCOS and how women can come off of hormonal birth control. Let's let's talk about, let's wrap this up with hormonal birth control for a few minutes, okay? Because this is such a huge topic for my friends, for clients of mine. Hormonal birth control carries a lot of risks. I mean, in your book, it's surrounded by this big black box. <laughs> like These are the risks that most of us don't really know about. And I just want to start this conversation out. I want you to go into these risks and, you know, maybe how to start thinking about getting off of it if you are curious about that. But so I had my first knee surgery back in 99. I was on hormonal birth control on the pill for like six months, my entire adult life. And that was that window. And so, you know, you have to go off the pill for a couple of days to get the surgery and then you double up and blah, blah, blah. So I was taking antibiotics and the pill and two days in a row when I took my antibiotics and then like an hour later took the pill, I fainted, totally oh passed out. And it was, it happened exactly the same two days in a row. And I was like, I don't know the science behind this. I just know that these two things together are causing my body to totally, I'm like, that's it, I'm done. And I never took the pill again in my life. So I know that that's not one of the risks that you're going to talk about, but <laughs> there are a lot of risks associated with hormonal birth control. Well, yeah, I mean, it goes on and on, but I would say to preface it, because it's always, it's always interesting talking about the pill, right? Because we live in a very like pro-pill society. So my stance is very clear. It is informed consent. So I believe that if we're giving women medication, and for the record, most women don't think of it as medication. Like you can fully be in a doctor's office and they ask you if you're on any medication and you'll say no, even though you're taking it. So we don't think of it as a medication. But anytime we're taking a medication, we need to be fully informed of the risks because women do experience effects of it. I, you know, We can debate whether we should call it side effects or just effects. But the key is that a lot of women experience pill-related effects and they don't know that it's related. And they actually end up like years later, desperately Googling and figuring it out. And that's how they find out. So the effects, I mean, there's lots when, and all women don't experience them right away. Some women experience effects like you had a negative experience and it happened right away. Some women fall into that category. Other women start to experience panic attacks eight years in. But essentially, I think it goes back to what we talked about. Our bodies are not like, it's not AC sold separately, right? Like, so the menstrual cycle, if we can first accept that it's a vital sign and that it is going to be affected by anything that happens in our health and in our life, then it's easier for us to understand how this pill can affect all these different areas. So in order for it to work, one of my, like, I have all these phrases and examples, but like when you eat kale that has been sprayed with pesticides, the person who designed the pesticide didn't design it to disrupt your endocrine system, right? Like that wasn't the specific, like the specified purpose of it. But when you take the pill, it was specifically designed to disrupt your endocrine system because that is how it functions. In order to prevent you from getting pregnant, <laughs> it has to stop you, like the majority of hormonal birth control stop you from ovulating. Not all of them, but most of them stop you. So that's their like express purpose. When you stop a woman from ovulating, then she's no longer producing her natural estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. And when that happens, that is when we have all of these effects. So that's how you can have 20-year-old women with low libido, vaginal dryness. That's how you can have women suffering from depression. The pill also interferes with your nutrient absorption, and it really increases your need for 
a lot of nutrients. So B vitamins, for example, vitamin B6 is uh, the most ridiculous in terms of how much you would have to take to offset the effects. And vitamin B6 and testosterone are related to our mood. Whoa. So it just goes on, right? But that's one of the reasons why women who take hormonal birth control are more likely to experience depression and anxiety. And in addition to that, it interferes with our ability to choose partner, which is really interesting. I didn't think that there would be that much research around it. Oh my gosh. I just had a <laughs> conversation about this. Okay, go. Cause I want to hear if it's the same thing that I was talking about. <laughs> I'm sure it is. So basically it's called the major histocompatibility complex. And what that means in English is that when you are meeting somebody in like just the natural courting process, you are going to perceive the way that they smell a certain way and they're going to perceive the way that you smell a certain way. When you take hormonal birth control, it affects how you perceive scent. And so, you know, a lot of, we've heard these articles and things like that, but I've spoken to a number of women who maybe they met their partner while they were on it. So they were on it already when they met their partner. And then at some point they go off of it and all of a sudden their partner has this smell that they never noticed before because it actually changes how you perceive their scent. Yes. So I've talked with women who are like, and they're terrified. They're like shocked. They're like, I've been with my partner for years and now we want to get pregnant. And I went off of birth control and now I'm not attracted to him anymore. Like that's the effect. Well, and the research, like when you dive into it, so the way that we smell is a reflection of our genetic makeup. Like this is, it's like environmental biology. I had to like search through to find this information. It was fascinating. And what they show is that women who are on birth control are more likely to choose a partner whose genetic makeup is similar to theirs, which it's, it's like crazy talk, right? Like this sounds like a science fiction novel, except it's real life. And so there were other studies that are super controversial to say. I just say it because that's what the research has to say. So if anyone wants to tell me I'm not being gender respectful, but the research showed that women who were on the pill were more likely to select a partner who was more feminine, and who had, like, they would, fe- like, they would literally feminize the characteristics of the face. Like, you could look at it yourself and, like, they would make the man look more feminine. And the women, so it's controversial to say, but what it means is that it changes the way that we perceive others. But it also changes the way that others perceive us. So there was this really interesting study that I found. And again, controversial, I suppose, because I know some women were like, how are you going to use a stripper study in your book? But I did, though, because they actually did the study. So they had, they actually went into these strip clubs and they had women who were on birth control versus women who weren't on birth control. And they actually measured if there was a difference in their tips. So the women who weren't on birth control, who were cycling naturally, so, you know, approaching ovulation, their natural estrogen and progesterone, cervical mucus flowing, whatnot. And these women actually had a significant increase in their tips around ovulation. And then it would kind of taper off around menstruation. And the women who were on birth control, it was about the same. There, there was no like ups and downs. And so overall, I believe it was like $83 per shift more. <laughs> wow. And that was research about what they call a competitive advantage. So their hypothesis, like they're trying to find out, do women, do naturally cycling women have a competitive advantage over it? So it affects how you perceive others, but it affects how others perceive you as well. Bizarre, mm-hmm. right? I mean, that one thing, I, I'm going to, I love that this is coming right at the top of our, <laughs> at the end of our interview because that feels like a psychic bombshell. Yeah, because it can mess up who you would choose to be with. And that's really like a, a huge violation. And so, I mean, for, for all the women who are now like terrified, if you, it's hard, right? Because not all women have that experience. And I'll, some women meet their partner when they're not on the pill and then they go on the pill right? But it has serious implications. What we probably don't have a lot of time to talk about today is one of the things that I'm most passionate about, which is the effect that hormonal birth control has on fertility. Because it's largely downplayed by the medical field as a whole. Oh my gosh. I have so many girlfriends who have just struggled post hormonal birth control to get pregnant and have a healthy pregnancy. And it is like, that is a, that is such a huge, huge topic in your book and on your work. And I do want to send another shout out to your podcast, Fertility Fridays. Fertility yes, Fridays. Friday. Yeah. <laughs> you can say Fertile Fridays. <laughs> We're so fertile over here. <laughs> and again, a good portion of your book really goes into that. And you do coaching around that as well. And I want people who are interested in that because it is such a deep and nuanced topic to go and get your book. And you have a free chart that your book lists in the back that people can go check out. Is it okay if I shout out the charting workbook as a 
Oh yeah, it's it's still in progress though. So there's like a waiting list landing page. Oh great, good. I'm Get on the it. waiting list. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so you can go to the fifth vital sign book dot com forward slash charting workbook, and we'll put that link in the show notes for this episode. And your book, The Fifth Vital Sign. I mean, at least there was so much that we didn't get a chance to cover. It's incredibly well researched. What over a thousand scientific studies and journals are referenced in this? Again, this is a textbook for women who feel like they didn't get the education, and none of us did, by the way. So you're not alone. Didn't get the education and the knowledge that you need to really take control of your fertility, of your cycles, and to feel like you are your own best expert. So Lisa, congratulations. Beautiful work. I'm so, like, I'm so excited for the women who are going to get this book and really start to feel like they can take charge of their life with this. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate it so much. And yeah, it's been an amazing journey and I'm just really happy that it's out in the world now. So it's available on Amazon. It's an Yay. ebook and paperback format. I'm working on the audio, of course, as a podcaster. Everyone's like, where's the audio book? Oh, like, of course. Oh, I'm working on it. All is done. It's in the process. And then for the listeners, you can get the, the first chapter for free over at thefifthvitalsignbook.com. So thank you for helping me spread the word about body literacy and the importance of our fifth vital sign, Alex. Oh, thank you so much. I know so many women are going to want to get this book. Lisa, take good care. Thank you for being here on the show. Everybody come back for more episodes. We'll be back soon. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Really appreciate you being here. Go check out Lisa's book. Don't forget about Catrice's book, Unfuckable With on Amazon. And if you love the show, go on to iTunes, leave a review, share the show with somebody you love. You can follow me on Instagram at Delicious Alex. I hope you'll be back next week. I hope you have a beautiful week yourself. Take good care. Mwah.